I've described brass tactics as a guide to blowing into a brass tube and demanding union scale for the result. Seems like it should be pretty simple, right? If you're just joining us, this is the fifth in a series of videos relating to the brass tactics 660 routine. If you haven't seen the previous episodes, you might want to start at the beginning of the playlist. Arpeggios is the third exercise in the 660 routine. Having established lip vibration on the lead pipe and the mouthpiece in the previous two exercises, this one brings the horn into the equation. Now that comes with advantages, but also challenges, because the laws of physics have greater bearing when a vibrating pipe is measured in feet rather than inches. If you were to unravel a B-flat trumpet, you'd wind up with a pipe that is just over four feet long. It gets progressively longer as you depress the valves because that channels the air through additional tubing. Seven valve combinations mirror the seven positions on a trombone slide, but because it's less visual, I find that some students are unaware of what actually happens when they push a valve down. So let's start with a brief physics lesson. A pipe of a given length, as determined by the valve combination or the slide position, has natural frequencies of vibration that correlate to the overtone series. When you lower the pitch of the instrument by depressing valves or extending a trombone slide, all of those natural frequencies or partials descend by the same amount. When we put together seven of these overtone series in adjacent half steps, we wind up with every note of the chromatic scale, and also numerous overlaps where the same note can be played with different fingerings. Now these alternate or false fingerings have small variances in pitch because they're mathematically derived from a different fundamental pitch. Now this is taking us into the realm of pure tuning versus equal temperament, and for more on that, I'd refer you to my book Tuning Tactics, and I'll link to it in the description. To produce a desired note, and beyond that a resonant tone quality, the vibrations of the lips must align with one of the nodal frequencies of the pipe. The arpeggios exercise, and really all the ones that follow, are all about adjusting the functions of the body so that it works with rather than against the immutable characteristics of a vibrating pipe. Variation one of this exercise uses ascending slurred major triads beginning on a low C. Subsequent starting notes descend in half steps until you reach pedal C sharp. As I talked about in episode two, pedal tones appear in many of the exercises in the 660 routine at the end of a line to relax the chops. In this one, they're treated as part of the line, which effectively lowers the working range of the trumpet a perfect fourth from low F sharp to pedal C sharp. Each arpeggio ascends up to, but generally not beyond the top note in the first line. For example, in level three, you start with a two octave arpeggio that ascends from low C to high C. That arpeggio is lowered by half steps until you reach the key of F, which starts on a pedal F, and then the high C is added to the top of the arpeggio. In this way, they not only become progressively lower, but they get longer as well. Variation two begins with an octave slur, which is followed by a slurred minor triad up and down. On this one, the starting notes go up in half steps, as high as you can go, but with complete control and at moderate volume. Beginning this exercise with an octave slur is based on what I call the springboard principle, and it comes up again in the last exercise called range. The idea is that to set yourself up for the large interval, you lay into the bottom note the way a diver depresses the board on the last step. You establish airflow on the lower note, and you let that carry you up to the upper note. Now to be sure, the embouchure and the tongue level are involved in executing any interval, especially a large interval, and the coordination is crucial. But in general, the more you keep your focus on the airstream, the better. If I get a good clean octave slur to start, then my chops feel really well set up for the triad that follows. To demonstrate variation one, I'll begin with a one octave arpeggio up to high D flat. I'll then lower the starting notes to each note of a D flat triad, always going back up to the same high D flat. Eventually I'll get down to pedal D flat as a starting note, which will give me a three octave arpeggio. Now the goal is to feel and sound the same on the top D flat, regardless of the starting note, but the further away you start, the more challenging that becomes. For variation two, consisting of octave slurs and minor triads, I'll demonstrate in the keys of C minor, F minor, and B flat minor. That'll have me covering a range of about two and a half octaves from low C to high F. Here's a few things to note as you watch the demonstrations. On both variations, I try to keep the volume to about mezzo forte or less. I'm trying to find the right balance of air and lip compression for each note without resorting to any extra force or pressure. I think it was Philip Farkas who described this as knowing the combination to a safe. If you do, you can open it with two fingers. When the line starts from a note in the pedal register, 
you want to make sure that you fully utilize the slot for the notes above it in the normal low register. I describe this as falling upwards into the slot. At all times when I'm playing this routine, I make a conscious effort to reduce external embouchure movement. This happens right from the setup of the first note. I try to have everything in place, fingers, lips, and air, so that the only moving part at the moment of attack is my tongue. At the end of a line, I hold the embouchure in place until the air and the sound have stopped entirely. You might think about an orchestra conductor who keeps the baton up until the sound has finished reverberating throughout the hall. These are the kinds of conscious physical actions that we do when we're playing exercises so that they become habits when our minds are focused on playing music. For this exercise, I use the CS66M mouthpiece because the tone quality of the larger cup is most in line with what I'm trying to produce. The Brass Tactics 660 routine continues in the next episode in this series, and you'll either see that one overhead or another video that YouTube thinks you'll like. <laughs>